some YouTube commenters say it's boring just looking at a talking head. I have to agree. <laughs> Gone are the days where I put so much energy into making slideshow PowerPoint presentations where all you got of me was my voice. It's too much work. So, imagine my nose is the graphic and my eyes is the line going through the... You know, whatever, you get the idea. <laughs> and here's the x-axis and here's the y-axis. Okay. <laughs> Here's the animated figure walking by. Okay. Um, I figured this out decades ago when I was much younger, but it's worth saying now because we didn't have YouTube back then. It has to do with this so-called Big Bang Theory, which there are plenty of people who now, it's becoming very popular to come up with an alternative to the Big Bang. Well, this one is predicated on Vedic tradition, and... The Vedic tradition says that every, if I can get this right, I think it's every 2.2 .2 quadrillion years, um, we go from a day phase to a night phase, or from a night phase to a day phase. The night phase is called pralaya, it's called the night of Brahma, or Brahma? Brahma, the night of Brahma the night of the Creator, in which everything goes to sleep. And whatever state it was in when it went to sleep, it comes out the same way it went in. The next morning, it's just clean and fresh. And the sages, you know, recognize the Vedas and, and yada yada. It's said that um, we're at the mid... we're approaching the midday of our current day. Now, a day, or a night for that matter, is, uh, if I have this right, 1.1 quadrillion years long. Now, the question then arises, what does this have to do with what we know in physics, what, what little I know in physics? Okay, so this is the linkage here. Planck's constant is the minimum quantity of energy necessary for change to occur. And we know, by definition at any rate, we define the actuality of our existence predicated on change. Everything changes, and if it didn't change, it wouldn't be real. It would not exist as we know it. So, how do you, how would I, how do I reconcile <clears throat> a day phase versus a night phase in which existence doesn't go away, yet it stops being active? How can that be? Well, Planck's constant gives us half the solution. The other half is a very simple, basic concept that we're all familiar with in day-to-day -day life. You know, there's a Vedic expression, as is the macrocosm, so is the microcosm. Well, as is the cosmic body, so is one's own body. Well, we know that when we're stressed, we tend, we might eat less, but we might also, at, at first, we might do, eat more. And we might sleep more if we're depressed. Um, we do things in excess, and then we have less energy anyway to get anything done, and we have more confusion. So what if Mother Nature... And a third element, somebody asked Maharishi, well, where does stress go when we meditate? We get, we get rid of stress from our physiology, but where does it go? And he said, it goes out to the universe. Well, is this a problem? No, don't worry about it. <laughs> Because eventually it builds up in the universe and the universe goes to sleep. And it's timed to go to sleep anyway at the same time, which kind of makes you wonder. You know, uh, the relativism of uh, Einstein said that uh, the clocks speed up or slow down based on how fast you're traveling. But what if they speed up or slow down not based on how fast you're traveling, but how much stress there is in the environment in which the clock resides. Real stress, stress having to do with space itself, getting stressed in the area where the clock is. And if it's more stressed, then the clock would slow down and eventually come to a dead stop. And that's what happens when everything goes into pralaya. Everything stops. But how can that be in terms of physics? So my idea is that 
Planck's constant is changing even now as we speak. It's just changing in, in such a small way we don't even notice it. I mean, it's incredibly small amount of energy as it is. And for it to be increasing in a, I have to say, a gradual slide of an exponential rise in which it's gradual now, but it will accelerate towards the very end of the day period, the 1.1 quadrillion per period of years, as such that as the energy, as the minimum quantity of energy required for a change to occur, Planck's constant, sh should that go up under because it undergoes stress, increasing stress, accumulating stress, then it becomes harder and harder for change to occur. And that would mean that the energy doesn't go away from the system, but change goes away from the system. So that the energy required for change to occur is not enough. And so change stops happening, even though the energy is still there. So that you haven't created or destroyed energy, yet you've put a stop to change. Simply because stress built up. Through no fault of anybody's, you know, stress. <laughs> you know how much stress animals go through? Tremendous amount of stress, and they don't even plan it, you know. They're so jittery, they, they don't know what's going to happen when, and if it'll be their last moment alive, you know. They, they go through a lot of stress. We don't even, <laughs> many of us, don't even know the amount of stress an animal goes through, unless you live an animal-like existence <laughs> from moment to moment. That's a different story. Anyway, so I think what stress is, is a structural defect. We know that from a piece of metal. If you keep bending the metal backwards and forwards, if it's bendable at all, eventually it'll break. But if you stop before it breaks and let it rest, the, stre the, the weakness in the metal that's leading to a break will actually try to heal itself and strengthen itself. And it's just a piece of metal. If a metal can do that, the universe can do it too. It just needs rest, a break from activity, from change. And if we fail to take rest, then it's forced on us in 1.1 quadrillion years, whether we're <laughs> ready for it, like it or not. But 1.1 quadrillion years, it makes me wonder now if that's a fixed period of time. We'll never know. Because if the cycles of nature that tells us what time it is change their rate, based not on something constant like some universal clock, like the vibration of the cesium atom excited by the uh, orange ray of light. I mean, huh? You know, I mean, you know, atomic clocks? That's kind of bogus. <laughs> it's good for short periods of time. You know, human scales of uh, duration. But when you're dealing with um, the universe of such vast periods of time, I think it's kind of bogus to expect an atomic clock to be consistent over the span of quadrillion years or so. I think, thinking this through, is that there is no constancy to time. Time is literally the gauge, the dipstick, by which we gauge stress. So if it's 6 a.m. sunrise, cosmic time, the end of Pralaya, the beginning of the new day, the clock starts to tick because there's no stress to stop it. Because the clock is merely act, represents activity and everything in nature is cyclic. But when... Well, no, in this sense, the sense for when time runs out is inversely related to stress. So it's a different form of clock. Okay, so we think of a clock with hands moving, but this clock, it's the opposite. It's the lack of motion on our so-called cosmic clock that causes time to accelerate. The time of the death, so to speak, of the day, the sunset of the day. So it's a kind of an uh, inverted way of thinking about time, or a clock analogy of time. But... I'm beginning, to, I'm, I suspect it's not something that is absolute. 
Why should it be? It's in the relative. <laughs> so it's going to be influenced by its environment, which is the universe, because it's a cosmic clock. And the stress of the universe is probably going to vary or impact the, the, the rate of time. And we'll, we won't know the difference because we're immersed in it. We won't know anything differently. <laughs> we're not outside the universe, so we, you know, unless we were cosmic and transcended the universe, we wouldn't be able to tell if time sped up or slowed down. So I think this is where Einstein's idea of time slowing down or speeding up comes from. Not something that we can perform an experiment of. Unless we can change our location such that we're in a more stressed environment versus a less stressed environment. Otherwise, that would be the correct way. And then we'd have to define what stress is correctly, according to the cosmic definition of stress. Um, <laughs> and, and then we could relativistically tell differences in time between one spot in space and another. Or, more correctly, one spot in time versus another. Although, well, no, and see, that's the thing. It has to be at the same time or else we'd never know the difference if it was a difference in points of time that we took the measurement of time itself. But we're not going to know the difference. We'd have to have the same time reference in order to measure a difference in time in two different locations in space. Did I lose you yet? <laughs> so it's stress that changes the perception of time. Charlie said so. Well, there you go. He would, you know, happy, or Marishi for that matter, happy times, time goes quickly. But how did Charlie put it? Well, he was saying the same thing, he just used different words. When consciousness rises, time per is perceived to go more quickly. <clears throat> well, a rise in consciousness leads to greater expansion of happiness. So, you know, happy times, time goes quickly. Morose times, it seems to be going very, very slow. <laughs> so, yeah, when stress builds, then time will slow down, along with the whole universe itself. So, you see, I was right. I didn't even realize it. How about that? I have confirmation. <clears throat> so, time is relative, but not based on how fast you travel, but based on how much stress there is in the area of the universe in which our clock resides. And of course, everything is cyclic in nature, and so everything is a form of a clock. You know, some, probably some master cycle of nature that has to do with the day phase. You know, maybe it's some kind of rotation of the entire universe, you know, beyond our mere galaxy, right, you know? Um... <clears throat> Some would think that it's the expanding universe that then has to contract, and then it has to, there's the Big Bang, and well, maybe there is no Big Bang. Maybe it's just a yawn. <laughs> Very, you know, sleepy eye. You know, kind of wake up real slowly, like, oh, I don't want to, that sleep was so nice. I don't want to leave the bed. I don't want to open my eyes. So it's, it may not be a bang. <laughs> it may be <laughs> very begrudgingly <laughs> wake up, you know. <laughs> It may not be like a militaristic bugle call in the morning, you know, wake you suddenly out of bed or something, you know, or the alarm clock going off. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> uh, free to speculate, whatever we want. Anyway, this is all recent stuff. I just came up with just this minute, just talking about, thinking about it right now, but the mechanism of, of how physics could substantiate the Vedic view has to do with the shift of Planck's con so-called <laughs> constant. And then we find out there's nothing constant in nature, and the so-called laws of nature are not laws after all. They're rules of thumb. <laughs> and how good's your thumb doing? Well, right now it's a little bent out of shape, so I don't know about that rule that went with it. <laughs> the, the, the rule is bent out of shape, too. <laughs> I mean, everything is subject to change. What, you think that can't... These are immutable laws of physics, you're right. <laughs> Show me a law that, that, that's just begging to be broken, right? How many times the crooks will say this? Laws were meant to be broken, or else lawyers would not have made them. <laughs> <laughs> Did 
do you go to jail if you, you break a law of physics? <laughs> they make all these movies about bank robbers and old-time crooks, you know, stealing from the train in the 1800s. What about now we, we don't have train robberies anymore because we don't have trains to steal from. We have laws of physics instead, and then we go after people like Stanley Meyer. You broke the law of physics. You go to jail. You know? Isn't this the most darndest business? we got to make up something. It's got to be, oh, we, that law went out of favor. We can't regulate them on that one. Now we got to make up a whole new thing. Well, let's see. What else can we still regulate? Thou shalt not pick your nose in front of a YouTube camera. <laughs> oh, you're going to jail. <laughs> Flag. <laughs> oh, no. We got to make up new laws just so you can have something to break and keep you cowering in the corner. I better not break any laws. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's see. Does this violate the second law of ther thermodynamics? Let me see. Oh, I don't know. I can't, just can't breathe because my left nostril is blocked. <laughs> I better open up. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> These things are so silly, and we take it so seriously. And both serious and silly starts with the letter S. Hmm. <laughs> Any doubt in our mind to get them mixed up? Hmm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm wearing my saddle laughing. Yeah, i got to stop talking and laughing, too. <laughs> this is my goofy period. Oh no.